Thank you everybody for coming today to this quiet workshop on Python and relational databases right before spring break. My name is Moisir Peter Sapareda. I'm the research data librarian here at Columbia University Libraries. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me and my colleagues by writing an email to data at library.columbia.edu if you ever have any questions or any uh, concerns related to a research project involving data. We don't slash can't help with homework, um, but if you have a, a thesis or a dissertation or something like that, then we, we can help you with just about uh, any, well, to the best of our abilities, to nearly any aspect of that process. So today we are doing a long overdue workshop on, uh, to, 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 on Python and relational databases. This was requested by Roger over the summer. Roger over here. He requested it over the summer. And I provided it, but then, or I was going to do it, but then, sorry, I have to log in here. I thought I took care of this, but apparently I didn't. Um, we had to cancel that workshop because we had flooding. <laughs> so this room didn't flood, but that room flooded. And you may or may not know, but two floors above that room are the uh, SEPA bathrooms. So it wasn't a pretty sight. So this room was full of the contents of that room, drying out, and so it's a whole lot of information Maybe you didn't want to know, but now you do. So yeah, so Roger requested this workshop, and now we get it, finally. OK. So I'm going to assume that you know a little bit about how these um, Colab notebooks work, and a little bit about um, the sort of stuff we've been doing so far. I know not all of you are return guests, so I'll fill in some of the details. But basically, uh, we're going to talk about how relational databases, um, what they are, how they work, and then um, by kind of showing what they aren't. So. Um, like I write here, a database is a collection of data, um, much like a data frame. So the difference between a database and a data frame is that the data in a database are structured into relations. And whereas in a data frame, the relations aren't quite as obvious or they're abstracted in some way. And I'll explain, I'll get to that while we're going through this. So we're going to start by sort of building a fake version of the data that Roger has been using so far, which is uh, New York taxicab data. So you have to uh, press play on this first cell to install two libraries that we'll get to in a little bit. The first library is Faker, which generates fake data, which is very helpful when you don't want to do real, like, when you just need fake data that looks a little bit real. And the other library that has to be installed, because it doesn't come installed by default on Colab, is Pony. And we'll get to Pony at the end of today. So the first cell with actual code here creates a data frame that's a little bit like what we've been using with the taxi data so far. So I'll just press play here. It should all work fine. Everything here should be more or less familiar to you. If it isn't, please let me know, and I can explain these things. Um, we're importing Python's built-in date time library to handle dates and times. Uh, NumPy for numerical Python stuff. Pandas to work with data frames. Faker, I mentioned already, to create fake data. And then we create this fake variable that's an instance of the faker class. I also have these random seeds here. Um, 
You may remember from previous workshops that if you, if you set the random seed, it just means that you have a little bit of control over the, determinist, the deterministic nature of the random data that you create. So when we, when we set the seed, we always get the same results, even though we're using random functions. So it's a little bit useful in a teaching environment. OK, so I created a couple functions here to make the data. We can go over this in greater detail later, but it does, you know, it uses a couple different random distributions to figure out a bunch of randomly selected lengths of trips, when they happen, how many people are in the, um, how many passengers there are, um, how much the fare costs, how long it took for the taxi to go from point A to point B. Um, you know, I, I was kind of proud of this, but we don't have to go into the details of how I did all the math here. But what you end up with here is these last couple of lines here where you get a list called data that runs this build taxi data function 100 times. And then I feed that data table, let me make this a little bit bigger. I feed that data list, sorry, into a data frame called DF. And then I add another column called speed KPH, KPH which um, divides the distance by the difference between the pickoff and drop off time, and then shows the head. So this is a lot, but this is mostly throat clearing type stuff to get us to this table here. And you can just see what the data looks like, what the data look like. So there are 100 values total. Here are the first five. So you can see there's a pickup time, a drop off time, a distance traveled, a number of passengers, how much the fare was, how much the driver or how much the rider tipped, and what was the average speed of the taxi. Um, and that's it. So this is more or less what we were working with the past two weeks. And we'll just move a little bit ahead with this sort of stuff. So I say here, the next section is called, so time to add relationality. So what does that look like? So in this data frame, we each row stands in for a trip, right? A trip has these properties. A, every taxi trip has a, has a start time, has an end time, has a number of customers, has uh, a distance that it traveled, um, the fare and the tip. Like we can say that every single taxi, every single taxi ride has these properties that are inherent to it. If we think of an entity called a taxi ride, they all have a pickup time, a drop off time, et cetera. In the real world, things are a little bit messier. You can take a trip with multiple people that has multiple drop offs, et cetera. But this is a, luckily a slightly simplified world. So let's assume that this data isn't data from the New York City taxi data but is the data specifically for a specific taxi company that I call Master Splinters Taxi Company. And the reason it's Master Splinters Taxi Company is because Master Splinter has four drivers, Leonardo, Donatello, Raphael, and Michelangelo. And he wants to keep track of these four drivers because he's uh, not only does he own the taxi company, but he's also a teacher who wants to teach these four drivers how to be uh, good turtles. Um, so in this next cell, I randomly assign one of these drivers to each ride. In the real world, this doesn't make sense. I leave it as a question here why, but I'll also answer it. Unless someone wants to take a stab why it's a bad idea to take a bunch of taxi data and arbitrarily assign drivers to each. Four, one of four drivers to all of them. There may be overlap between the rides, which means that hypothetically you could get the same driver driving multiple taxi rides at the same time. And this is just a risk you run into when you randomly do stuff. So we're going to not really care about that, but I had to use, 
This is kind of funny to me. I had to use a slightly different narrative seed here. If you're familiar with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, you will understand why I had to use a different seed here, because I'm sort of massaging the random results to tell a specific story. Um, so, okay, so this is drivers. There are four drivers, Leonardo, Michelangelo, Raphael, and Donatello. And then I create a new column on the data frame called driver ID that uses uh, picks from drivers every time. So each one has a new driver. And uh, let's add a cell here just so we can see that that's true. There you go. So there's a driver ID now here. Michelangelo, Leonardo, Raphael for the first five, right? You should see the same thing if you were to do df.head also. OK. So like I said, Master Splinter doesn't just run a business. He's also a teacher. And one of the things he does, we haven't really looked at how to aggregate data, I don't think. Have we used group by a bunch in, in, in your Pandas workshops? Uh. We talked about how cool it is, but we, have, we haven't actually really used it. <laughs> OK. All right. Well, well, now you get to see how some of that stuff works here. So he wants to take that data set of 100 taxi rides and turn it into a data set that only has four rows, one for each driver. And then all of those rides, it's going to collapse them and tell them different things about what are the characteristics of each driver. So this uses. Uh, the group by method, which is built into pandas, uh, a pandas data frame. And it says group by driver ID. So because there are only four drivers, we're going to get four groups. Uh, all the rides that Donatello drove, all the ones that Leonardo drove, all the ones that Michelangelo drove, and all the ones that Raphael drove. And then this aggregate method lets me explicitly state what the new columns are based on the aggregations of the data. So this means that I'm going to create a new column called fair count, which counts the number of pickup dates. I pick pickup dates just because it's the first column. It doesn't matter. But what that means is fair count is going to count how many rides each turtle gave. So it counts how many times Donatello gave a ride, how many times Leonardo gave a ride, et cetera. The second column, distance, takes all of the distances and adds them up. It sums them. So you can see this here. The aggregator function is count and then sum. Fair total takes all the fares and sums them. Tip total takes all the tips and sums them. And average speed takes the speed and takes the average of the speed. So we have three different aggregating functions here. Count, the total number sum, add the numbers up, and mean, take the average of all the numbers. Um, and then I add another column called tip rate, which takes the tip total and divides it by the fair total. So you can see about what percentage, uh, what kind of tip percentage each driver is getting. And then if you press play here, you see the new data frame. So I'm going to stop here for a second because this is not something that we've done in the workshops yet, but is maybe advanced. Mm -hmm. um, so if you've, done, if you've done pivot tables in Microsoft Excel, that's effectively the same thing here. But this is, this, is, this is tricky, so I'll go over this again. We take the data frame that has rows of taxi rides. And we say group them by driver ID. So that creates a new data frame called earners that only has four rows, one for each driver. right? If there were five drivers, then it would be five rows tall. Um, if we grouped by some other thing, then it would be if there was some other kind of categorical variable or something, or we could group by the number of passengers or anything like that. And then we use this aggregate method to spell out these new columns that tell us about the data as a whole at once. So either it counts them, or, or adds everything up, or takes the average in the case of uh, speed KPH.
So what we get down here is it took those 100 rides and smushed them into, into the same number of rides. If you add 24, 31, 17, and 28, that should equal 100. Um, Y'all are probably better at arithmetic than I am. And so it's 100 rides, but now it's turned to be the story is told not by each individual ride, but by each driver. And so that's, so, you know, so we get a story here. Um, Leonardo is the hardest working turtle because he gave 31 rides and drove a distance of 205 kilometers and earned $452 over the course of, uh, this is 30 days, but it doesn't matter, but over the course of this data set, um, and earned $71 in tips, and had an average, average speed of 20 kilometers per hour. Um, in the world of this uh, data set, 20 kilometers an hour is the average speed anyway, that then I do a little bit of, um, finessing to randomize it a little bit. But that's, we can talk about that in greater detail later. Anyway, so, so far so good. We had 100 taxi rides, and now we're talking about the 100 taxi rides in terms of four turtles. So um, Master Splinter decides he wants to implement an incentive program for his turtles. And so for each driver is going to have his own baseline tip rate, and whenever the driver exceeds that tip rate, they get an extra slice of pizza for dinner, right? Um, similarly, when he, looks at these, when he looks at these results, he sees that Donatello is only driving 17.9 kilometers per hour, and he thinks maybe that's a little bit too slow, maybe Donatello is being a little bit too careful, maybe he should drive, you know, a little bit with a little bit more enthusiasm. And he's also worried that Raphael might be driving a little bit too quickly because his average speed is 21 kilometers per hour. So he also puts in an incentive program. So every time a driver exceeds his tip rate, which is to say he gets a higher tip than whatever that baseline percentage is, or um, keeps his speed to within 0.5 kilometers per hour of a target speed, he gets an extra slice of pizza. This is a very worked example, but I think it makes a little bit of sense. And so now, now we can take the original data frame, DF. And so I just created this dictionary here with Donatello, Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Raphael. And I gave an average speed to all of them. They all have a different average speed that they're supposed to maintain while they're driving. So Donatello is a little bit faster than 18.1. Raphael is a little bit lower than 21, and a tip rate of 16%, uh, 15 15.5%, 15.5%, 15.5%. .5%. And then I add more columns to the data frame. So uh, what's the driver's target speed? What's the driver's target tip? Was the driver within the target speed or not? And did the driver get tipped more than their baseline tip? And then, uh, let's, let's press play on this. Um, and then I should have had a break here where I could show what the new data frame looks like, but we'll see in a second. And then create yet another data frame of pizza slices. So, uh, so now I'm taking DF again. So again, those 100 taxi rides. I'm grouping by driver ID again. So I take those 100 taxi rides and turn it into four rows, one for each driver. And then I create two new, two columns for it. One called driver within target speed, or sorry, one called safe speed and one called good tip that use these columns driver within target speed and driver exceeds target tip. So let me, let me go over this again. I created these new columns on the regular data frame. Like, so we have pickup, drop off, customers, how many customers, what the fare was, what the tip was, what the distance was. I think 
of what the speed was gets calculated, then the driver, then driver target speed, then driver target tip, then driver within target speed, then driver exceeds target, target, target tip. So we just keep smashing more and more columns onto these 100 taxi rides. And we end up with another report. So we can tell that um, over the course of this data set, Leonardo gets 18 extra slices of pizza for dinner, and Michelangelo only gets nine. So this is why the, the example is especially worked and why I messed with the random seed, because Michelangelo is always the lazy one who never, who never gets his work done or anything like that. So he's always getting the, the worst tips and doing the least amount of driving and so on. So that was funny, I thought. OK, so like I said, I've just been smushing more and more columns onto this data set. So if we do df.dtypes, that's how in Pandas you see um, all of the columns in your data frame, and you see what kind of data, what kind of data is in each of those uh, columns. We can see that we've started to, this is starting to sort of lose track of what it's supposed to be. This is supposed to be a data set that is about taxi rides. But now, one, two, three, four, five, five of the uh, columns don't have to do with the specific taxi ride, but they have to do with the driver. And uh, two of them, target speed and target tip, don't even have to do with the specific ride. Target speed and, uh, within target speed and exceeds target tip those are at least calculated on the fly as part of each ride. But target speed and driver target speed and driver target tip just keep getting repeated every time. So every time you have a driver ID of Donatello, you also have a driver target speed of whatever his target speed is and a target tip of whatever that is. So it's just this repeated information. So now let's add one more wrinkle. So let's say Master Splinter wants to also track customer data. So he asks every customer to leave their name when they take a ride, and then he wants to send a New Year's, a New Year's card to every customer too. Um, so, so he needs their address also. And then let's say he also wants to implement something where every fifth ride is free, like a loyalty program. So things get more complicated. Um, and I end up adding these customer columns. So this is, you know, like we can go over this code again, but it's just more randomish stuff to sort of make it look like there are all these pretend customers involved. And um, we end up here with I can't remember how many how many this is sixteen columns for each taxi ride, five of them have to do with the driver, and four of them have to do with the customer. So we've really lost track of um, what this data frame is supposed to be about. So then the question is, like, or what we may be tempted to do is, like, we'll just have a different table for the drivers and have a different table for the customers, or have a different data frame. Like, why do they all have to be smushed together? And that's a great idea, except they rely on each other. Because in order to see how many slices of pizza a driver gets, we have to see how many rides they've given and, and compare those rides to see if they were driving safely, if they got good tips, et cetera. And similarly, similarly for the customer, if we have a different data frame that has the customer's name and address in it, that's all fine and dandy. But how do we then? how can we tell if the customer is on their fifth ride or not to get a free ride? We have to then talk back to the, we have to look at the list of taxi rides to see how many rides they've taken. And this, uh, this can get even more complicated if we start seeing if, uh, we want to see if the, a driver has particular favorite customers that they always tend to be, be riding with and so on. So this is what I mean when I say, please, can we be relational? Because what I'm describing here is having multiple tables of data, 
multiple data frames, however you want to think about it, that have that are related to each other, but that keep what's specific about the entity in question to itself. So this is, uh, you know, like I write here, the trip data should be just for the trips. It shouldn't include what the driver's target tip rate is or what the driver's target speed is. Similarly, it should not include the customer's address. You don't need to include the customer's address every single time the customer takes a, takes a ride. That should be saved somewhere else. And there should be a link that says, oh, in this, this ride involves this and that customer. So um, if you've used relational databases, this, may, this is starting to sound very familiar because what I'm describing is a relational database. So you end up with three tables, three specific structures of, you can think of them as entities, and you can talk about the relationship between them. So every trip has a driver, and every trip has a customer. We can also say every trip belongs to a driver, and every trip belongs to a customer. A driver, on the other hand, has many trips. So this is a, a one-to-many relationship, or a has-many relationship. So a driver has many trips, but every trip only has one driver. Similarly, a customer has many trips, but every trip only has one customer. I mean here like the paying customer, the person who swipes their card. Obviously, there, are, there can be more people in the taxi, but only one person gets credit for the, uh, for the loyalty program. And we can even formalize all of this in what's called an entity relationship diagram. So I'm going to take a break here for a second, catch my breath. So far, so clear, more or less. I think the most complicated Panda stuff is already behind us. Everything should be easier from here on in. So this entity relationship diagram, this is something that um, you may see in the future, especially if you go into like corporate blah, 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 um, because it's a, it's a good way of atomizing data structures and figuring out what pertains to every single specific thing, what are the properties that belong to it, and what are relationships that it has with other things. So a trip has a pickup, a drop-off, a distance, a number of passengers, a fare, and a tip, and a speed, sorry. And then it also, like I said, has a driver that we referred to by the driver's ID. They have a unique ID, and a customer who has a unique ID. The driver has a unique ID that just that is, tells us who the driver is. And in the case of this example, it's the name of the driver. But if you had two drivers named Paul, then you would have to have different IDs for them. And the driver has the target speed that they're trying to stay within in order to get pizza slices. And then they also have a tip, tip rate that they're trying to exceed in order to get extra pizza slices. Yes? Yeah. No, for sure. Um, in this in this example, I didn't include a trip ID, but that under normal circumstances you would have that. Yeah, that's exactly correct. Um, because, yeah, you would. Uh, well, it's it's a it's a it's a good question, Be, because. So how to put this? Um, the like you and right, right, right. No, yeah, I, I, I understand what you're getting at. The, the, the reason, the reason why, and this may be bad design, but the reason in my head 
why it's not as important for there to be a specific trip ID is because you'll never be grabbing a specific trip's information by its ID. Mm -hmm. Because you will, in the database, you would say something like, give me all of the trips where the driver ID is Leonardo, or give me all the trips where the customer ID is blah, blah, blah. You'll never say, give me a specific trip ID, because that the ID typically has no real meaning in and of itself. In an ideal world, the ID has no meaning. So what instead you would do is you would say something like, give me all the trips where Donatello was the driver. Give me all the tips where the fare was greater than $20. Give me all the trips where there were six passengers or fewer. Give me all the trips that happened on February 4th. You would be doing queries against properties of each trip to build, to build your, your data set, as opposed to saying, give me this specific trip ID. However, you know, uh, I should have probably included a trip ID. Mm -hmm. And then different things are related to each other. I somehow always want to have a unique ID yeah. for all of it, all the relationships to call it together. I don't know. I, not for this particular example, but yeah. in general. Well, as, as you'll see when we move to actual and to an actual example of a database, you'll see the different ways this, sorts of, this sort of thing plays out. But yeah, um, of course, also in the data frame, so when we have the 100 trips, they don't have a unique ID, but they have the data frame's index value, mm -hmm. which, which can go from 0 to 99, or you can set some other index value that can stand in for that too. But yes, in, it, this should, trips should have an ID here. OK. So like I say here, the data now tracks three entities and three tables. And like I said, there you go. Now we have this relational database. So instead of having a, a data frame with a bunch of extra columns smushed onto it, we've split it up into three columns or into three tables or three data frames that somehow, and I've yada yada it so far, somehow talk to each other. Um, although part of how they talk to each other can be inferred from how I created those other columns, um, which is to say I created lists or dictionaries with the added data. Because one way of thinking about this, as we'll see, is of thinking of each data frame as a list of dictionaries. Um, and then, so you have th the three data frames, the three tables, as three, um, three lists with, made up of predictable dictionaries. We'll get to that in a second. Yes? So can I just ask, based off the two things I just heard, is the point, just so, just so I understand it, is the point more so of the relational database? Because I too would, if I was coding this myself, I too would have a trip ID and I would have the two things talking to each other, but then they would probably be separate data frames and there would be some kind of conditionality like if trip ID is this, give me blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. But so is the point of this that you don't necessarily need to have some kind of variable from which they both fall because everyone's drawing down from these dictionaries and that's where the relationality kicks in. Is, is this part of what makes this relationality situation work? The, 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 my question is so sense. the, a little bit. So what, what you're describing, so when, when you're, so what you're describing is effectively how these databases work what, um, which is that they, they do what are called joins. So they say like, find everything in this table where this ID is equal to some ID from some other table. Um, and we'll get to that in, in, in a couple minutes. Um, but that, so, and that's, that's how these databases are, are set up and how they work, right? Um, 
it, so it's the same kind of workflow that you're describing. Um, but as the, well, I guess this is sort of a good question. Like, why would you have a database in the first place if you can already do what you're saying? And I sort of, um, I didn't address this in this, uh, in this workshop because I actually am not sure why you would want a database instead of what you're describing, like a bunch of linked data frames that are just very explicit, that have these sorts of explicit relationships where this, this column on this data frame refers to the IDs on this other data frame or something like that. Um, this is the same thing, except it formalizes it at the level of software and at the level of um, the level of the actual like formatting on the disk even, which makes uh, doing these kinds of queries allegedly much faster. You can index based on them, and so so that's part of why you would want to do this. Um, if you have like when you when you end up with database when you end up with information structures that really rely especially on many to many relationships um, which we'll get to um, then it would make sense that you would want something a little bit more robust holding all that stuff so if you have like millions of customers so an example of a many, the like classic example of a many to many relationship is that um, and Item, let me think how this works. An order at like an online store can have many items, and an item can be involved in many orders. So like if I buy a Diet Coke and you buy a Diet Coke and that person buys a Diet Coke, that's Diet Coke comes from the item table. So it says order and it gives the ID, the SKU, whatever of Diet Coke. However, so items show up in multiple orders, or the same item can show up in multiple orders. But orders, do I have this backwards? Orders can have many items, but no, items can't, yes. Orders can have many items, because it can be a Diet Coke and a regular Coke, and Items can have many orders because three people, like, or I can buy a Diet Coke three times. That's three different orders, right? So these, these many-to-many -many relationships get big fast. And that's some of what, again, like this is, this is a funny thing because we, in um, what occasions this workshop is like, well, when do we deal with databases? Like I haven't queried a database in forever, it feels like. Um, 20 years ago, that was how you got the data. But now you download a Parquet file, you download a CSV, and you sort of go to work. And you build that relationality. Um, GIS is a perfect example of this. You build that relationality in using the GIS software because all of the census data, for example, will have a FIPS code. So you link up different data tables based on the fact you join them based on their FIPS codes. So yeah, I don't know if that really helped helped answer what you were asking, but yeah, it's um, uh, it's the same thing. But we'll see in a little bit one of the benefits to doing things this way that holding these different data frames together. I don't think they make that available. So we'll get to that. Okay. Um, so now we're back to what is a relational database. So this is, again, like what we've been talking about. So you have these data that are separated into tables and are then linked together based on these relationships. And I said there's a one-to-many relationship, a one-to-one -one relationship, um, and a many-to-many -many relationship. The many-to-many -many relationship is the most complicated. The one-to-one -one is the easiest. And the one-to-many is very helpful. Um, so. For example, if each driver in this example, if each of the turtles had their own car, there could be a one-to-one -one relationship between the driver and the car. But you may say, well, why not just include the car data in the driver, in the driver table? If it's just one-to-one, -one, it's the same thing. Well, this is a design choice. You know, like 
maybe you want to do a report to see which cars need new tires or you know what the mileage is on the cars or something. So it just sometimes makes sense to keep these entities separate. Um, there are many ways to interact with the inter in with relational databases, but we'll use SQL, which is the structured query language. And you can see SQL, here's an example of it. It looks a little bit like regular English, sort of. Um, so if we imagine the database as I designed it here, driver, tip, and customer, we can see a query like select fare and tip from the trips table where passengers is greater than three and order by pickup date time. You know, so this will give us the fare and tip amount of every trip with more than three passengers sorted by pickup time. So SQL queries can get complicated quickly, but you can see this is not, this is already a slightly complex one because it's doing a couple different things. So it's um, selecting only two attributes, fare and tip, from the trips table, and it sets a condition where passengers is greater than three, and then it adds a sorting variable at the end, order by pickup. Um, so now a little bit towards, uh, so then how do we do the relationality? And this goes a little bit towards uh, Lydia's question. Like we have, uh, we have what are called joins. So you have this example here, select count, which means select the rows, but then count them before you give them to us. So this will give, a, give instead of a bunch of data, it'll just give a number. So select the count of trips. So select all of the rows in trips, then join the trips table and the drivers table by where the trips driver ID is equal to the drivers ID. Okay, so you're taking these two tables. You have the driver table, the drivers table, and the trips table, and you're joining them. So you're saying find every um, every instance, every trip, sorry, where the driver ID matches, where trip's driver ID matches driver's ID, where, and here's the condition, where drivers.id equals Leonardo. So this says select, if this were just select star, it would be select all of the trips where Leonardo is the driver. So instead here we say, and then we add a second condition here. This is really tricky. We add a second condition where the tip of the trip divided by the fare of the trip is greater than driver's target tip. So this is how you can query the database to see how many pizza slices Leonardo gets because he performed, he got good tips. So you select all of the rides and then just count them. So that's what this count is. Select all of the rides in the trips table where you link it to the driver's table. The driver's ID is Leonardo. And then you also do some math here to figure out how many times he outperformed his tip. So this is the, this is the same thing as the math that we did up here, except written out or however I did this, oh, this is the customers, however I did this up here for pizza slices. It's the same thing except in SQL. And I don't want to spend a ton of time on this because the goal is not to have to write this. The goal is to like write SQL as little as possible. The goal is to be in a position where you're like, I'm using an object-oriented language. Why am I using this? like? old syntax stuff, can't I leverage the power of an object-oriented language in order to make this easier? And the answer is yes, of course you can, and that's what we're going to get to. OK, so uh, that's enough with the turtles. Um, but let's switch things up and get Pokemon data instead. OK. So um, I went looking for Pokemon databases and found a couple. 
And the rest of this is based on a Pokemon data put together by, I think, like a pair of undergrads for a class um, somewhere. I don't know. I just found it on GitHub. And it works. So we'll be using that for the rest of these, uh, these cells. So um, we can sort of, let me see how I'm doing for time. Oh, I'm doing OK. Um, this code should look a little bit familiar. This is how Roger goes about importing data from the government and whatever for, for his workshops. Um, it doesn't work for us because uh, you can take, so the, the way the students made the database is they created a MySQL database. MySQL is just a type of database server. Um, it's a very popular one. It's free. And, um, but you can't use it in Colab per se because in order to be able to talk to a database server, you have to like be able to call it up and talk to it. This is this is one of the um, one of the reasons the government doesn't want the government makes data available for download as opposed to just keeping an active database connection open that you just call up and you make requests like these select blah, blah, blah from blah, 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 because that gets expensive super fast. They would much rather just give you the data once, have you download however many gigabytes that is, and then let you do whatever you want with that database, as opposed to whenever you get an idea in your head, you basically execute a query that says, oh, show me all of this and show me all of that. And here's an extremely complicated query that's going to tie up your server forever. So. Um, this sort of stuff is why um, websites can get slow, too. Um, and a lot of uh, part of why some of this seems a little bit antiquated, at least to me, is that a lot of websites are trying to figure out ways to not have to be built on talking to a database server all the time um, and how to use different kinds of queries to manage those data loads better. So. MySQL, the way you create a MySQL database is you execute a bunch of commands. And you just say, like, the first command is like create database, and you give the name of the database. Then you say create table, and you describe what the table looks like, and we'll see that in a second. And then you say insert into table trips, and then every single row of data you explain. So you end up with this huge, huge, huge text file that is a representation of the database because all of the data is can be described as commands that enter in specific numbers or text. If you have binary stuff like pictures, you can save that sort of stuff in a database too. Um, so that won't show up as you won't get pictures in the middle of the text file. You'll just get a bunch of gibberish. But what I'm getting at is, is that these students have this file called dump 2016.0519.sql that is just a giant text file. It's, I don't know how many megabytes, but it's multiple megabytes in size. And that's the entire database as a text file. Then what you do is you read that into a MySQL server that executes all of these commands one by one. And at the other end of it, you have a database. So it's a very clever way of doing things. Um, it's like a little bit autopoetic, in fact, because the database has the instructions for how to create itself built into it. So it, it has the, um, when you do a dump, that's what it does, is, is the database dump is not just like a CSV. It's actually the list of commands to execute in order to reproduce what the database looks like. And this can include things like different user permissions. And uh, like it can be very, very complex. Unfortunately, we can't use that here because we can't um, because we can't use the SQL file in Colab. So instead, what we do, what I did was I, I read it into a database. This isn't super important. So I, on my own computer, I created a new database called Pokemon. I read in the data dump. Then I converted the database from MySQL to SQLite 3 or SQLite 3 which is what we're going to be using today. So MySQL, free, super popular, 
rely needs a server. You need a server to be running. So that can be on AWS, that can be on your computer, but somewhere there has to be a living server that you can talk to, to make, to make a connection to and to query. SQLite provides almost all of the same functionality, except instead of relying on a server, it just needs a single file that, you, that it writes to and reads from. So what we end up with is instead of this dump file that's a text file, we end up with this binary file called Pokemon SQLite. And that's this next cell. If you press play, it'll download this binary file from GitHub, and it'll write it to the Colab. And if we click on the folder here, you see it right here, Pokemon SQLite. If you ask to see it, or I don't know if you can see the files, there's no point. It's a binary file. There's nothing interesting there. What happens that's interesting is from how we talk to it. OK, so next step. We need to use a magic extension to load, to tell Colab to load function, database functionality, which it does not normally have. So you click play here, and this loads, loads the extension SQL, SQL, and then you run the command by doing percent SQL. And the first command we run is this SQLite colon slash 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 Pokemon SQLite. All that means is we've made a connection to the database. So all this, all this stuff that I've been talking about, so we, we, we took the Pokemon data that was a huge text file that was these instructions to create a MySQL database. On my own time at home, I created that database, and then I converted it to an SQLite database, put that back up on GitHub, and now you all have downloaded that new version of the database into your Colab, and now you've loaded it so into the file structure of your Colab, and now you've loaded that database into memory of your Colab virtual machine. So, um, so far not terribly interesting, but things will get a little bit cooler in a second. So let's talk for a brief second about this database. This is the, um, the entity relationship diagram that these students made. So I think like I mentioned, it's 14 tables. Um, here's probably the main table, Pokemon. So every Pokemon has an ID. Every Pokemon has a name. They have a species ID, which actually we won't be working with. They have a height, a weight, and a base experience. Then you can see there's an another table called base <coughs> stats that has their hit points, their attack, their defense, their special attack, special defense, and their speed. Then we have a bunch of other tables that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, you can use SQL commands to get information about the table. So pragma table info Pokemon tells us about the Pokemon table. So we're not, we're not dealing with the data yet. We're just talking about the data structure. And that's, that's also like one of the important things to, to think about here is that in a data frame, you just have like, yeah, those are integers, those are strings, those are date times, and that's about it. Here, the structure is much more elaborate. So you can see that there are one, two, three, four, five columns, even though they, they show up as rows. These are the columns in the table. Poke ID, poke name, poke height, poke weight, and poke base experience. It shows you what their types are, integer, varchar. Varchar means variable character with a maximum length, maximum length of 79 characters long. And then some other um, properties. So not null, if not null is one, that means that you have to put in a value for that. So we know that every Pokemon has an ID and every Pokemon has a name. They don't all necessarily have a height and weight. And then the last thing here, PK, I don't know what DFLT value is, it doesn't matter. The last thing here is PK, which stands for primary key. So the primary key 
is the unique ID that defines that entity. So every Pokemon has this poke ID, so it's not null, it's required. And it's the primary key, which means that it is the key that we will use to link to the other tables. And you'll see how this works in a second. OK, so, I, yeah, go ahead. Like just one half a second. Okay. So you might have said it, and just in the half a second that my brain went dead, I might have missed it. But you see the the different names, the folk ID, the folk name, the, so the different variables here. Yep. Um, and looking at that, this the chart. Table, yeah, the chart. Um, I'm guessing these are the base variables of the Pokemon, like you said. The table right here. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, so what about species ID? Um, that one, I'm not entirely sure what it means, that it's an unfilled red diamond. Okay, so that's, um, that's Yeah, okay. so the, the funny thing about this project is they made some choices that, uh, that don't make a ton of sense in how they organize this data. Um, so I can't answer like, like this, th these specifics, but it's, it's a good question. Like, yeah, species ID doesn't show up, but, um, but is in their diagram. And species ID would hypothetically point to a table called species, but there is no such table here called species. So like, like based on um, uh, SQL um, idiomatic use, species underscore ID implies the existence of a species table, but there is no such thing. So. Yeah, they, they got a little goofy with some of the, some of the way they designed the database. OK, so um, we, can, we can prove that this works by running a, a SQL command. So this is a command that selects the ID, the name, the attack, uh, the ID and the name from the Pokemon table, and then the attack, defense, hit point, speed, special attack, and special defense from the base stats table and joins both of these tables together where Pokemon poke ID equals base stats poke ID and then adds another limit on it by saying where the attack is greater than 100 and the defense is greater than 100 and the hit points are greater than 100. And then I don't know what this group by does, but it, it returns this data. So th this is a slightly complex query that, that uh, is in regular English. What it's doing is saying, give me all the base stats for all of the Pokemon where their base um, attack, their base defense, and their base hit points are all greater than 100. Yes? So I'm so sorry. It's, it's great. Uh, so um, with this one, how do you, I know you just kind of, well, I'm, I'm assuming you've arbitrarily chosen 100. Um, but my question is, if I was, say I was doing this and you weren't here and I was like, okay, I've got some other, I don't know, maybe like Nintendo, I've got some other SQL and I'm doing these things. Uh -huh. How do you, did you beforehand look at the description of each of these things so you knew the range, so you knew where to go? That's or how a, do I, that's. Like, what, that's a great question. Um, this is the authors of the database use this specific query in their assignment. <laughs> like they have like a little presentation at the end that you can look at, like a little PowerPoint, and they're like, here, here's proof that this database works. So um, I don't, I don't, like I thought working with Pokemon would be fun. I don't actually know a ton about them, so I don't know if a hundred attack and defense is a lot or a little. But I know that if we look at, if we press play, we get five Pokemon here. Rhydon, Hippodon, Rhyperior, Regigas, and Arceus. Arceus? Arceus? So, and we see they all have attacks, defense, and hit points of greater than 100. And then, um, this is still just using the percent SQL magic extension. So we still have to write these SQL queries. We're going to stop doing that in a second, but I just want to show you how this works here. And then that SQL thing also lets us convert this into a data frame.
And so this is, uh, this is a data frame with these five Pokemon in it made up of two different tables. Because remember, the base stats, so attack, defense, hit points, speed, special attack, and special defense, the base stats are in a different table than the Pokemon name. So it smushed them together. OK. Now, 20 minutes left, and this is the most important part. So thanks, thanks for putting up with all of this so far. Um, what we want to do, like I said earlier, is leverage the fact that we're writing with an object-oriented language um, with some functional uh, programming flourishes and be able to leverage that instead. So instead of writing these SQL queries and thinking about our data in terms of these like long, long sentences that we have to write with these capital letters, you don't actually have to make them capitalized, but whatever. Instead, let's convert the entire database into a bunch of objects, into a bunch of classes. So I don't know how much familiarity you all have with, with defining classes in Python. It was like, I spent like two minutes on it in the intro to Python back in January. But uh, basically, a class is a special type of object, or, or dictionary, let's say, is a special type of dictionary in Python that has a predictable, predefined structure. Like if we create a dictionary, like my dictionary equals brace brace, then it's just an empty dictionary. It can have anything you want in it. With a class, it inherits certain properties from somewhere, and you can also define specific properties for it. So we'll see what that looks like in a second. Um, and when we talk about turning a database into this kind of abstraction, what we're using is an object relational mapper because we're taking the relations of the database and mapping them onto this object-oriented structure. And you'll see this in a second. So in this structure, a table becomes a model, which is typically represented by a class, like I said. A row in that table becomes an instance of the model, which is also a class instance. And a column in the table becomes an attribute of the model, um, or what we call a class property. So we'll be using, there are a bunch of different ORMs in Python. Um, I chose to use Pony because it looks um, the most functional programming-y of the ones that I was looking at. SQL, Alchem SQL Alchemy is, I think, the most popular one. Um, if you create complicated websites with Python, you may be using Django, which has its own built-in ORM, et cetera. So we'll be using Pony instead. So this part I'll spend some time on. So we import Pony, or we import the ORM object from Pony. So ORM is coming in that's going to have a bunch of methods that we can use to do cool stuff. So we'll create a database here. I'll just press play here. We'll create a database using the ORM database method. We'll bind that database, starter DB. Bind, so we'll tie it to a file, pokemon.sqlite. So we're saying we're creating this sort of blank database object. Now point it to the specific file. But don't, like, the database already exists, so we don't have to create the database. And then we're going to create one little, one little class, Pokemon. And this should look familiar, because what I'm recreating here is the structure of the table. But instead of poke ID, we have ID. And instead of poke name, we have a class property called name. And instead of poke height, we have height, poke weight, weight, poke base experience, we have base experience. So again, you can see some of the, some of the stuff that I've been talking about so far is being reproduced here. So ID is, initial, is, is a class property. So every instance of a Pokemon class is going to have an ID property that is defined by the primary key. So remember, primary key is the required unique identifier 
that is how you link across these different tables, right? It has a required property called name, and then optional properties, height, weight, and base experience. So I press play, and it generates this object. So now I have this variable called starter db, and then I have this class Pokemon, and I can do stuff with it. So for example, I can do all Pokemon query equals ORM select. Remember select in those SQL queries in capital letters, select. So select, but instead of writing select star from Pokemon or something, I'm using a hopefully familiar, but if not, we can talk about it, a Python generator here. Yes. Typically, I think of uh, classes as something that you need to instantiate, but it doesn't seem like you've explicitly instantiated Pokemon as a class. You've just defined it. OK, so um, to my understanding, you how do you instantiate a class? Like you make a class instance. Like yeah, that's a different. So, like so that's. Pokemon lowercase equals Pokemon uppercase. Parentheses, parentheses with the with the init. Yeah, yeah. So, in that instance, you're not instantiating the class. You're creating a an instance of the class. Yeah. The class already exists. So, so perhaps the answer to your question is that. Uh, so how does the computer know that Pokemon is a class and not just something I've arbitrarily described? Is because here, this last line that I skipped over, is it looks for classes that inherit, sorry for all this auto floating, it looks, starter db generate mapping, looks for every class that inherits from starter db entity and builds the structure of the database from that. <laughs> it's a little bit hidden, yeah. So. Yeah, so we, and we'll, you'll, good question, because you'll see that in a second in a little bit more detail. So ORM select P for P in Pokemon. This, this should be a somewhat familiar structure to you, like a list comprehension type thing, P for P in Pokemon. And then if we ask just for the type, we won't get anything terribly interesting. We get a pony query type. But then we can start doing some stuff with it. If we add this sort of, slice looking operator at the end, bracket, colon, bracket. It sort of converts things into a list. It turns the query into a list, and we can start iterating over it. So we can do, um, uh, what did I do here? So the type, th these two types. And then we have um, all Pokemon lists, the zeroth value of it, the first value in the, in the list is Bulbasaur, who has a height of 7. I have no idea what units these are. I don't know what 7 is. Centimeters, meters, I don't know. Um, and then we can see that we have these sorts of things to play with. right? So we've just queried the database, and it's given us information about Bulbasaur. Um, then we can get more complex, complicated. So you can see that in, um, you can use the to dict, to dict method to create the things that you get from the database into dictionaries that you can then feed into a data frame. Because a data frame, the first query, uh, when you do pd.dataframe or pandas.data frame, the first um, uh, argument that you pass it is the data for the data frame. And the data can be a list of dictionaries. So what we're doing here, Pokemon DF, is we're creating a database, pd.dataframe, and the database is built from this list comprehension. So what is this list comprehension doing? Let's go backwards. It selects P for P in Pokemon. So that means it selects all of the Pokemon from the database, grab all of them, and then for every Pokemon in that query result, so it, it adds this little slice looking operator in order to turn that into something resembling a list. So then for every member of that list, we'll call that Pokemon and we'll run the Pokemon to dict method on it. So we end up with a list of Pokemon 
dictionaries where every Pokemon, where every dictionary looks the same. It has the same properties because it knows what properties to expect based on the class definition of capital P Pokemon a couple cells above. This should, I have tingles because this is kind of cool to me. Like it's because this is a much, just much cleaner way in my opinion than having to do these SQL queries, but whatever. And then if we ask to do a description, it tells us um, ID we don't have to think about, but it tells us there are 722 Pokemon in the database. Um, the average height is 11. Again, I have no clue what <laughs> unit that is. No unit I know of makes sense where an average Pokemon would be 11 tall. The average weight, same thing, 567. Maybe grams? No, that's no, that means they're like 10 pounds on average. They're bigger than that. <laughs> And I don't know what base experience means either. So who knows what units these are, but there you go. The average Pokemon is 11 tall and 568 fat. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but yeah, so, and, and this is, you know, this is a very terse way of describing this, but effectively what we've done is we've used a generator, an extremely idiomatic Python structure to query the database, and then we've used a list comprehension to create a bunch of dictionaries that go into a list that become a data frame. Um, like I do describe here, but you know we can obviously do um, Pokemon DF head to see the top five Pokemon. You know, very wild stuff. Okay. Um, that's just the Pokemon. So let's, the whole point is that the stuff is relational. So let's add relationality. So you have to start from scratch because of the way, uh, like Roger said, you have to instantiate the class. So we have to redefine everything um, in order to have it reread the classes. So this was called starter DB wherever it was. Um, and now we just have regular DB. So this cell is extremely long because it's doing all of the relationality. I didn't do all 14 tables. I just did one, two, three, four, five, six tables because I got bored. Um, but you can see how complicated this gets. So earlier, Pokemon, the Pokemon class only had ID, name, height, weight, and base experience. Now we can see there are one, two, three, four, five. There are five new properties that the Pokemon class has, which describe its relationality. So every Pokemon has an optional property called base stats, which links to the base stats table. Let me be I wish I could have this image open at the same time, but every Pokemon links to base stats. Um, every Pokemon also links to abilities, that will come up. Every Pokemon links to moves, that will come up. Every Pokemon links to types, and every Pokemon links to habitats. I think those are the, those are all the, all the relationships that I describe here. So you see here, moves refers Every Pokemon has multiple moves, and the way, this is complicated, has multiple abilities, multiple habitats, which I wasn't expecting. I thought a Pokemon only would have one habitat, but apparently it's a many-to-many -many relationship. And it has many types, which I also wasn't expecting. I thought a Pokemon would only have one type, but it's defined in the database as a many-to-many -many relationship. We'll look at that in the last minute. Um, the many-to-many, -many, so like back to the question earlier, many-to-many -many relationships, the way you organize them is you have an intermediary table that has, that describes the links between the two different things. So um, moves are, there's a moves table and there's a Pokemon table. And then in between them, there's a Pokemon moves table that just has two columns, maybe it has three. One of move IDs and one of Pokemon IDs. 
So when you say, show me all the moves that a Pokemon does, it actually does, it calls up that intermediary table um, and bases the query off of that. And in regular SQL, you would have to write a somewhat complicated expression. And you'll see what you have to do here and be like, why do I ever have to write SQL again? I don't want to. So let's play this. And now, um, now I'll show this. So this is the same query as above to show the uh, base stats of attack, defense, hit points, speed, etc. if they're over 100. So you saw earlier the query, whereas here you have something that looks, again, in my opinion, like much more idiomatic Python. You say Pokemon select lambda, so create an anonymous function with P, which stands for Pokemon, where P base stats attack. So base stats, remember, is not on the Pokemon table. It's on the base stats table. But I can refer to it as P, Pokemon, dot base stats dot attack. This is where this gets cool, because I can start hoisting these methods, or hoisting these properties as methods or as properties. So B base stats attack is greater than 100, defense is greater than 100, HP is greater than 100. And then I created this to base stat dict function here that just sort of renames things. And then if we press play, we get a very similar looking data frame as above, but without having to write SQL. Then I did some other cute things here. So, um, or I thought they were cute. So I create a function that gets abilities based on a Pokemon's name, get moves based on a Pokemon's name. You can, I have Pikachu and Venusaur here. You can type in whatever you want for the names. And if you press play, you can see that the, it does Pokemon get name equals name. So it, so it grabs the first, person, the first Pokemon with that name. Um, I don't think name has to be unique, but it happens to be in this case. And then it lists, um, it lists Pikachu's abilities. He has two abilities. And Venusaur has a bunch of moves. I don't know if this is right or not. This feels like a ton of moves, but maybe it's right. Um, then we can grab all the Pokemon who live in a certain habitat. Same thing, habitat.getCave. And we see, like again, this, is, this syntax is, is so expressive and so natural feeling to me. Habitat get name equals cave. So every habitat has a name. So get name equals cave. And then for Pokemon in cave Pokemon, remember, not only is cave or habitat in a different table than Pokemon, they have at least one table between them <laughs> because it's a many-to-many -many relationship. So, but yet the result of the query, this cave, has a property called Pokemon that is the list of Pokemon that all have cave as their habitat. So if I do, if I press play here, we get a list of all of the Pokemon who have cave as their habitat. Um, so this is, this is jumping across the database, yet instead of doing these sorts of join on where equals equals, it's just, you just tack on the properties. Um, this is why we use ORMs. Then, uh, so I said earlier that I was surprised that according to the database, type is a many-to-many -many relationship with Pokemon, because I was like, well, shouldn't a Pokemon only have one kind of type? So this is how it's defined in, 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 the, uh, in the mapping. And in the database, if we look at the picture, and then I'm done after this. So uh, if we look at the picture, we can see Pokemon these like numbers mean things. So this number means that it's a one-to-many relationship. So one Pokemon can have appear in Pokemon types many times, and then types can appear in Pokemon types many times. So Pokemon types is one of these intermediate tables.
that manages a many-to-many -many relationship. So according to this, the way the students design this database, a Pokemon should have more than one type. It makes sense that a type would have more than one Pokemon, but the opposite didn't make sense to me. But, you know, we're all programmers here, let's query it. So, I mean, if, if you know your Pokemon, you know how this ends up anyway. So I say print Pokemon, and again, um, to me this is very idiomatic, um, idiomatic Python. Pokemon select P count, P types are greater than one. So count all of the Pokemon that have more than one type. And then tell me how many Pokemon there are like that, dot count at the end. Press play, 350. Okay, so apparently it's a thing. Pokemon can have more than one type. So then these last two lines of text here, or last two lines of code, Pokemon select, again, it's, this is the same thing, select a Pokemon at random, one random Pokemon that has more than one type. Use this little pretend slice operator to turn it kind of into a list. This is one of the problems, like when you query, it always comes back looking a little bit like a list, even if it's just one thing big. This is the difference between using dot .select and dot .get. Dot .get will only return you one value. But yeah, so random, like turn it a little bit into a list and then give the first value. And then print, what happens? Um, Skun Skuntank is a multi-type Pokemon, dark and poison. And every time we play this, we get a different one. Diggers B is a multi-type Pokemon, ground and normal. And we can just keep doing this all day because we have these 350 Pokemon that it'll just, it keeps saying, show me all the Pokemon that have more than one type, pick one at random, print its name, Pokemon name capitalized, so capitalize the name also, and then print type name for type in Pokemon types, which is again, two tables removed from the Pokemon table, but is accessible as Pokemon types. So that's it. Um, Zatan, maybe this is helpful if you have to deal with uh, databases. Again, people who give data out tend not to want to make you connect to a database because it gets very expensive. They prefer letting you download it. But um, this also may sort of if you are dealing with relational data in some way, like sort of maybe also help you think about using classes as a way to manage the relationality between the, the data. And that's it.